we're talking about self-betrayal. And this is coming out of looking at Joseph's life and what happened to Joseph in his life and the stages his life broke down into. The first one being the dreams and the revelation God gave to him of why he's on this earth. The second one being his family betrayed him. Almost immediately, his family betrayed him. And, and uh, how that betrayal, which happens to all of us, how that can affect us and how it does affect us. And we're into this, oh man, five, six weeks already, been talking about betrayal and explaining what it is and how it looks and how it affects us and how it changes our thinking. Betrayal will change you. Not because it, you want it to, but because it does. And you'll see that a little bit here this morning in some of these examples. Betrayal, the definition to betrayal is to deliver, surrender, or yield someone over to an enemy or to evil. For instance, in Joseph's life, they betrayed him by selling him and yielding him over to the, the Midianites who took him on to Egypt and, and they got rid of him. They betrayed him. We can get betrayed numerous ways. We'll give you some examples this morning and so forth. But it's, it's a yielding or surrendering someone over to an enemy or evil. Because it's such a bad experience, it changes us. Even if we're trying to watch it a little bit, it'll change us. It's something you really have to guard against or it will change you. The problem is once we are betrayed, if we're not really on our toes and guarding it, it will cause us to self-betray, and that's far worse than the original betrayer. Self-betrayal is when we believe our betrayers, and this is all review. Self-betrayal is when we believe what our betrayers have said about us, have done to us. We take it in, we believe it, and we believe it deeply enough, we start living our life by our betrayals. And we're looking at six ways we self-betray and how we get in a position where, where we not only were delivered or surrendered, yielded over to an enemy or to evil, we start doing it to ourselves. The first one we looked at, which we spent enough time on this, I'll just start there. Number one, we can betray ourselves by not recognizing there are two kingdoms at work in us. We can begin to think the, the reason this stuff is going on in our life, around us, is because there's something wrong with us. That is a telltale sign you've been betrayed and you haven't settled it. When you start wondering, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with my life? Because it goes this way. Questioning yourself always comes out of betrayal. Two kingdoms at work. One kingdom, Psalms 105, this is what God did with Joseph. Once he was betrayed, it says that Jesus immediately went to work on him, the Word immediately went to work on him, to form him and shape him and mold him into someone better that, that God could use. The other side is, once we're betrayed, the kingdom of darkness will immediately go to work on you and try to get you to because of the hurt feelings and what was said or what was done, try to get you to pick up an offense and hang on to those hurt feelings. And you start feeling bitter or angry or whatever it may be, and you don't let go of those feelings. Those two kingdoms go to work on you. God's kingdom is to make your life better. The other kingdom is to destroy you. Okay, We've covered that long enough. Uh, all this stuff is online. If you need to catch up, you can go online and, and catch up on the messages. So with that, we'll go from review into let's jump forward and use the time we've got here to see what we can get done. Number two, we betray ourselves by believing our betrayers and what the betrayal is saying about our dreams and future. And you could probably put in there and us because it's not only about our dreams and our future, but it's what they said about us. Like, for instance, in, in Joseph's case, not only did they deal with his dream and say, oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah but they attacked him personally and betrayed him personally. We betray ourselves by believing what our betrayers have said. So here's the question. Whose word are you going to believe? The person who betrayed you or your saviors? What are you going to believe about yourself? 
what the person who threw you under the bus said or what the word says? Are you going to believe what the betrayers said or what the people who love you, are committed to you, are in your life, those near you who want to support you, or are you going to believe what they say about you and about the situation? Which, which one are you going to go with? See, we betray ourselves when we start believing what the betrayer said rather than what the word says. I had somebody say to me, this is an example of this, someone say to me, I've had uh, someone really close to me tell me, it just seems like you were born to be sick. It's, it's like you're always struggling with a cold or whatever. It's like you were born to be sick. And they asked me, they said, is there such a thing? Could, I, could that be the actual, that I'm, I'm going to be sick the rest of my life? See, the questioning is in already. The statement from the person, that was a bad statement. That was, I don't know if they're just trying to be funny or what that was, but that was a bad statement. But now this person has a choice. I will either choose to believe what this person says and start living my life like I'm going to be sick the rest of my life and just expect it. Or I can believe what the Word says and what Jesus did, and I can come from that direction, deny my betrayer, and believe that. Now, if they want to self-betray, all they have to do is say, well, you know what, maybe they're right. Maybe I am going to be sick the rest of my life. Now, not only did they plan a thought that was really bad, now you believe the thought, and now you're going to propagate that thought. You will betray yourself. And guess what? You'll probably be sick the rest of your life. And the, 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 here's how it changes us. Once something is said or done, and that thing gets planted inside of us, whether it be a thought or a word or whatever, once it's planted, it seems to always come up at the most inopportune times. You know, when you begin believing your betrayer, you hear all those voices in your head that were handing you over to evil when it's time to make a decision. Voices like, you never do anything right, Carrie. And then it's time to make a decision about something. And the first thing that comes up is, boy, I don't even know if I can do this. Because I never do anything right. See, now you're on the verge of self-betraying. The fact that that thought is even there is going to, is going to try to affect your decision-making, your choices, but you're on the verge of self-betraying. You're not a good parent. I don't know what you're doing, but you're not a good parent. Well, are you going to believe that or aren't you? Somebody threw you under the bus. Now, if you buy into that, you're not going to be a good parent. You have no idea what you're doing. That will never work for you because nothing ever works for you. So let's say you buy into that. You believe you're what your betrayer said. They just sold you to evil because you know how that's evil? It's contrary to the word. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Except for you. Nothing will ever work for you. See, I just sold you to evil. I sold you to something contrary to the word. So I betrayed you. Now, if you buy that, when it comes time to do something that maybe is going to be a little risk involved or you're going to have to spend some money and I don't know if I should do this or not, you know what's going to come back to your mind? Nothing ever works for you anyway, so maybe I shouldn't even do this. And you may make your decision not on the basis of here's an opportunity, here's something I could do, on the basis of something that somebody told you years before. And now you self-betrayed. You betrayed yourself on the basis of what you believed and there's so many there's so many things you're ugly you're stupid you you're klutzy you you're so uncoordinated you you can't handle money you know there's so many things that have been told to us 
to sell us to evil, and the reason they're evil is they're contrary to the word. Anybody can handle money if they learn how. Anybody can ride a bike if they're taught. Am I hitting so many sore spots already that <laughs> we're all moaning and groaning? <laughs> maybe I shouldn't do this because, you know, da 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 that happened and this is what they said to me. And maybe they were right. And all these questions come. And, I, and there we stand. We're kind of, all those voices are speaking to us. We question ourselves a hundred different ways. And at the very least, this is what begins to take place. We find ourselves paralyzed. I don't know if I should or shouldn't. Because we've got our betrayer's voices talking to us. And we've got this other decision that needs to be made. I don't know if I... I, And it paralyzes us. And a lot of people end up living their life doing nothing. Because they were betrayed and they believed their betrayers. You should start a business. You're good at that. Well, I don't want to pray about it. Six months later, so what did God say about the business? Well, I don't want to. It's a good opportunity, but I'm still praying about it. So a year later, so what do you do with the business? Well, do you know where that comes from? They're fighting with all the voices in their head. Yeah, but if I do this, I could lose money. And I remember I lost money once before, and, and people found out. They threw me under the bus for it, told me it was a stupid idea. I should have never done it. And, and, was, and we're paralyzed. And it could have been God leading you to start a business so he can empower you to prosper, and there we stand. And we get nowhere. We get nowhere. Well, I just don't understand why God's not blessing me. He's trying to. He's trying to. But our own betrayal and then our self-betrayal. If I had a dollar for the hundreds of times I've heard God is leading me to do this and they do nothing about it. If I had a dollar for hundreds of times I've heard that, I could go on a really nice vacation. You can't believe how many people will, the Holy Spirit will lead them to do something and they'll get excited enough to tell me about it. I believe the Lord's telling me I'm no, 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 no. Nothing ever happens. They self-betray. And if you push that self-betrayal deep enough, it's because deep down in their heart, they have believed they're betrayers and they don't think they can do it. They quit. So it can start as simple as paralyzing you. Then it goes to, I, I'm just not going to do this. I'm just not going to take the chance. And if, our, if we believe our betrayer is deep enough, that constant negative input, the voices of betrayal, drives people into emotional problems, mental problems, physical problems, disorders develop, PTSD, all kinds of stuff develops. Our foundation, the foundation of our life gets cracked and broken, and we don't know what is truth anymore. So we're anxious and we're frustrated and we no longer believe what God has said in his word. We're no longer believing those who are committed to us and want to see us succeed. And as a result, we self-betray and we start heading down a road of making choices and decisions, how we live, how we interact with people, how the choices we're going to make for our future, we start heading down a road that we were never meant to walk down. That is self-betrayal. And the thing that drove us there is we were betrayed and we didn't know how to deal with the betrayal, which that's what we're dealing with next week is, is the points of how do you beat betrayal. So that was number two. Number two was... One was not recognizing the two kingdoms are at work. Number two is by believing our betrayers and what they've said about us and our future and our dreams, etc. Number three is how do we self-betray? 
if I can find it on my notes. There it is. By losing hope and giving up. We will only wrestle in our minds so long, and then we'll just back away from it. We'll quit. We'll lose hope and give up on our dreams. We give up on our call, on our ministry, what God's asked us to do. We give up on what we feel or what we felt the Lord told us. We give up on people. We give up on our children. We give up on family. We give up on our future. We give up on our career. We just, we just lose hope and give up. And once you quit moving forward, there's nothing anybody can do to move you forward. Once I say, I'm done, there's nothing anybody can do to get me going again. As long as I haven't self-betrayed and quit, I can be encouraged, I can be whatever, to, to get me moving again. But once I say, I quit, I give up, you have the ultimate say in your life. And once you say, you quit. That's the way it's going to be. Galatians 6 says, let us not become weary in doing good. Don't self-betray, for at the proper time you will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Amen. Galatians 6, a uh, couple of verses ahead of that, says, Do not be deceived, God cannot be mocked, a man reaps what he sows. Verse 9, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Betrayal tells you to quit. Just forget about it. Once you believe that and you actually do quit, now you've betrayed yourself. Now it's over. Unless you come out of that self-betrayal, it's over. You can betray yourself by just quitting or giving up. Let me give you a couple examples on this. You wanted to raise a big family. You were all excited about the fact you wanted three, four, five, six children, and you told the in-laws about that. And the in-laws ate you alive. What is wrong with you? You're going to raise that many children and this, you have no idea what you're talking about and how much money this is going to cost. And your friends make you feel like you're a complete idiot. Well, see, now, you're, you're, now you've been thrown under the bus for what God put in your heart. Now, if you're going to believe what they say versus what God put in your heart, first thing it's going to do is make you question, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. And if you let that go long enough, it'll start paralyzing you. Now you're beginning to self-betray. And you're either going to give up on the idea and say, well, uh, yeah, it's probably a bad idea. I probably should have never done that. Stupid idea. We just get our boy and our girl. We'll be good. And that might be good for some families, but some families, God actually wants them to fill their quiver. And the quiver is bigger than two. And that should be between them and God. But we think what God told us is good for everybody else. You ever notice that? When God tells us something, I think it's best advice for everybody. And in reality, it might be bad for them when it was good for me. You know? And some people, God wants to raise a big family because they're capable of pulling it off and raising a little army for Jesus. And they'll all grow up serving God. And many times, relatives get in the way of that. How are you going to pay for all? You ain't coming to me and asking for money. You know, we're making all these pronouncements, and they haven't had the first one yet. And what will happen is they'll either give up on the idea... Deep down aside, they know they should have, but they just give up on the idea they self-betray. Or secondly, they do it anyway. And every child they add, they lose friends. Because they don't want you coming over to their house with five children. And here, some of us can either say amen, understand that, and the rest of us probably should say, ouch, yeah, that was me. Because we had our perfect little house and all these little children come over. What if they break something? What if they spill something on the floor, Mike? Man. And we end up, the, the friendship circle gets littler and littler and littler and you're made to feel bad because you're putting your money into your family rather than buying new curtains and redecorating and, oh, you still have those old things? 
we changed ours a few years back. And then they go on and start talking about all, everything they're doing. I'm right, aren't I, Jim? <laughs> I'm right. It happens. It happens. And then we begin to self-betray. Even when we have four, five, six children, you can still self-betray in how you view them and how you treat them and how you put your life into them. You can get bitter, you can get angry, you can get revengeful, whatever. Here's a little homework for you on this one, just giving up and quitting. Think back 10, 20 years ago. What were you convinced that God wanted you to do, to live like, to accomplish back then? Think back. What, what was it in your heart that you, you felt, this is something that I really feel is a spiritual thing that God wants me to carry through in my life? Are you still doing it? Have you self-betrayed? You just quit and gave up. Probably because you got betrayed. Number four. We can self-betray by living our lives by the betrayal rather than by the Spirit. And we've talked about this quite a bit, so I don't think I need to dwell on this. But uh, Hebrews 10, verse 35, Do not throw away your confidence. It will be rich re richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, the Holy Spirit is the one to lead us and guide us and direct us and show us what we're supposed to do. We need to persevere so that when we've done the will of God, well, a lot of times betrayal will cause us to choose what someone else said versus what we felt God asked us to do. Verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. So we don't want to go there. We want to do the will of God. When we are betrayed, our decision-making process is messed with. Do you make decisions in your life because of what the Bible is saying or because what the Holy Spirit is telling you? Or are you making decisions on input you received from people that probably was even somewhat negative, but they were trying to give it to you as wisdom? If they were Christians, they're going to say, let me give you some wisdom. If they were not Christians, they probably said, what, are you an idiot or what? You people are really quiet this morning. You must be really looking at some pictures in your mind. When you make a decision, do you make the decision on past experience or on this is what I feel God is asking me to do? <clears throat> this is the will of God. This is what he's asking me to do, and I'm going to do this. Or when you make a decision, you look back at all the things that went wrong. And now on the basis of those things and what people said and what people did to you, and you know what, I tried that before and you should have heard what I got told. And da, 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 da. I am not doing that because of the betrayers. Huh? Are we following the Spirit? Are we doing the will of God? Or are we following our betrayers because we believe them? You tried to do something, an example. And by the way, betrayal is never positive encouragement, go get them, I believe in you kind of input. <laughs> betrayal is selling you to an enemy, selling you to evil, and it's typically opposite of what God would want you to do. But for example, this, this isn't a way it can happen. You tried to do something, maybe start a little business, or you tried to get a relationship, uh, a lot of people have been married more than once. You could throw that in here. You, you, you got married, the, the marriage didn't work out, or it could be as simple as you, you thought you had a good deal on a vehicle. So you bought it. What, whatever. You tried to do something that you thought God was leading you into. And the end result is it didn't turn out good. You missed God or something went wrong. It, it didn't work. The backlash that you receive from people, especially the people near you, parents, close friends, spouses, the backlash was so bad that you've determined, I will never do that again. 
When something comes to you, you won't even share the idea with your spouse. Because I've done that before and I just got ate alive. And I'm, I'm just not going to do it. What if the idea is God? What if what he's leading you towards is God? And now because of bad experiences, you're not going to do the will of God. You're going to self-betray and then ultimately betray him. You're going to cut it off before it even gets started. Self-betrayal. So many bad memories, pictures flood your mind, and we know the backlash that we just won't do it. I'll give you a personal example. A few years ago, the Lord had asked me to share some intimate things with a person, some thoughts, beliefs, and so forth that I had, and I'm not going to tell you who the person was, but some things that I felt I was supposed to share. So I did that, and when it was all over and so forth, I thought everything was good. Well, it turned out that they didn't like some of what I said. So they got a little group of people together and shared it with all of them and discussed the whole thing. Well, make a long story short, they got a hold of AFCM, Brother Caseman, my pastor, and tried to get my license revoked. Never came back and talked to me about it. But they were so stirred up about the whole thing that they tried to get me out of the ministry. I would call that a betrayal, okay? So now, I've forgiven. I don't hold any grudges. That's between them and God. I'm not going to get bitter over this. I tried to do all the scriptural things to, to do what's right. But you know what? I'll be honest with you. When God says, I'm supposed to share something intimate with you folks like I have the last couple of weeks, you know what goes off inside of me? Boy, I better really pray and fast, make sure this is God. Like what I shared, not last Sunday, the Sunday before, about what the Holy Spirit told me about betraying Him. And maybe I'm the only one here who's never done what the Holy Spirit asked me to do. You know. You say, Pastor, why would you say that? Because of the expression on some of your faces when I shared it. But see, that was a personal thing to me. And, and some of you had almost like an amused expression like, wow, so the Lord talked to you about that? Well, my whole point was you've done the same thing and he's probably trying to talk to you. But I'm not sure that connected, so I'm just connecting it for you. Just case. That really bothered me to share that. Why? Because I felt I hadn't heard God? No, it was just the opposite. I knew I had heard God, and I didn't want anything to do with sharing that. You know why? I've been betrayed before. And I know what it feels like. I know how it hurts, and I want nothing to do with it. So we can actually betray ourselves by not doing what God's asking us to do because of bad past experiences. Number five. Real quickly, we'll wrap this up. By allowing our personality to change. Our personality changes not because of what God did with Joseph in Psalms 105 and putting him in the forge and the anvil. This is what the forge and the anvil produce. First Peter, or Second Peter describes it. Verse 5, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and self-control perseverance. Those are the kind of things that God will change in your personality to change you when he's got you in the forge and he's got you on the anvil. He'll teach you perseverance. He'll teach you godliness and brotherly kindness and, and knowledge and self-control. He will change you. Change your personality. There's the kingdom of God at work in you. The kingdom of darkness at work in you once you've been betrayed is we are so fed up, so at the end, with the negative comments, the picking at us, the remarks, that not only are we making decisions on that basis, now we're touchy in our personality. We're touchy, we're distrustful, we easily get angered. Man, if somebody says something that can just set us off, it's like we're on the defense all the time. You ever meet people, it's like no matter what you say, it's like you said the wrong thing because they're, they're on the defensive. Well, their personality has been changed, likely by betrayals, by hurts. Some people become obnoxious, and they're usually the extrovert kind. 
They are going to prove to you they're not as bad as people have said they are. And they're just, it's like, quit it already. You don't have to brag about yourself. You don't have to, you don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to always be, I'm the star. You're aggravating me. You're obnoxious. Well, that comes probably from betrayals. And then the introvert goes just the other way. They become reclusive. They will just collapse in on themselves and come to the conclusion life will never do anything for them. And stress, depression, anxiousness, fearfulness, etc., all become part of it for both sides of the people. And we don't handle people the way we used to. Why? We've been changed by the pain of betrayal and we've self-betrayed. We're not the same person we used to be. We are easily frustrated, easily exasperated. We don't trust anybody. Everybody we hold at an arm's length. You know, just, I'm just giving you some. Now, hopefully nobody has all of these. I'm just giving you some idea of once we've been hurt and we're betraying ourselves, our personality changes. We used to be fun-loving. We don't laugh anymore. We used to make good jokes. Now everything is cynical and sarcastic. See, that's the result of having been betrayed, and we self-betrayed. Have you ever blown up if somebody walked away and said, why did I do that? Thank you. I'm not the only one. Or you you make a remark, and you walk away and go, you know, I could have said that a whole lot better. Why did it come out so fast that way? If you really pause and think about that, which I've done it, you will remember someone who said or did something to you some point previous, and you kind of told yourself, if anything like that ever happens again, I'm going to... Seriously. And you self betray And the last stage is this. This is usually the last thing that happens with self-betrayal. We sabotage 1 Timothy 1.19, holding on to faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have shipwrecked their faith. We cannot let go of faith without damaging our conscience. Holding on to faith and a good conscience. You cannot let go of faith without damaging your internal guidance system. Refusing to try again, as an example, is a form of sabotage. And once we refuse to try and it no longer bothers us, our conscience has also been damaged. See, if if you're presented with a problem or a situation or an opportunity and you say, ah, I just don't know if I can do that, and you're thinking it over, and, and I don't know if we've got the finances, or I don't know if I've got the, the, the ability, and, and I'm, I'm not sure my spouse is going to be one involved in that, and, See, it bothers you. I've got an opportunity. I know this is something I should be doing, but... mm. Okay, you haven't sabotaged yet. You're still in the process of deciding, should I self-betray or not? Once you get to the point of, okay, I'm not going to do that. Well if it was God and it was something that God really wanted for you to do or maybe your spouse or something would have been good for the family or whatever and you just kind of decided, nah, I know, it's, I know it would be best, but I'm not going to do it. Well, now you self-betrayed. Sabotage enters in. Once you get to the point, it doesn't bother you anymore. Yeah, I know I should, but it doesn't bother me. And you just go on, it doesn't bother you. You say, how does that work with Sabotage. Well, now it's going to be very easy for you to cut people out of your life, cut opportunities out of your life, cut situations out of your life that, yeah, I should be involved in, but I chose not to. And it no longer bothers you because you're not going to step out in faith to do anything because your conscience isn't even pushing on you at all. Your conscience is not broken. And then we get into a habit of sabotaging things. We find a way to get out of an opportunity. The relatives invite you over for Thanksgiving. Since it's past, we have a whole year to work on this. I can deal with this. And 
invite you over for Thanksgiving. You had bad experience at Thanksgiving with these relatives before. Sabotage is when you find a way, you manufacture a way to get out of that. I'm just not going to go. And this is why. Well, they're going to think that's a stupid reason. Well, it might be a stupid reason, but you know what? It doesn't bother me. Now your conscience has been damaged too. Because now you don't care how you're influencing people, what's going on, <clears throat> etc. We'll avoid events, we'll avoid gatherings, we'll avoid all kinds of things. We'll find a way to get out of it. Here's a big one. Consciously, or it might even be subconscious, it's just our mind goes there without us really making a, a willful, conscious choice. Sabotage is when we get so anxious about thinking about, well, I could do this, or this could happen, or whatever. We get so anxious about it, we are so convinced it's going to go bad, it's going to fall apart, that we just want to get it over with. So we make it fall apart. We don't wait for it to fall apart. We will do things to make it fall apart. And then afterwards, we stand there and say, told you it was going to fall apart. Let me give you an example. You're having problems at work. You feel like your boss doesn't like you. They made some decisions that hurt your feelings, and you feel betrayed. It's a stupid job. It's going to fall apart anyway. Well, now you're beginning to think sabotage. Now you're going to start doing things to get out of that job. Showing up for work late, consistently, doing a poor job, not being responsible with the area you've been given. You're going to start doing things because, see, this is all their fault. They hurt my feelings. And you will begin sabotaging until they lay you off, they ask you to leave, they fire you, whatever. And then you'll sit back and say, See, I knew this job was no good. You know what? It really had nothing to do with the job. It had to do with how you handled the betrayal. And you self-betrayed. There's people who get out of marriages this way. There's people who get out of friendships this way. Someone starts getting too close to you and you're, that, that thing comes up of bad memories and bad experiences and it's like, oh, this is going to go bad, this is going to go bad, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And you get so anxious that you just start doing goofy things that will either cause those people to drop you and run the other way or super commit to you or whatever you're looking for to calm down that anxiousness. You're sabotaging. This could have been something good but you started doing things to force it to break. And you didn't even know you are doing it. A lot of times out of fear. Yeah, I've got to skip some of these. Let me give you one more example. We'll bring this to an end. Fear. Taking what we think God told us and making it good for somebody else. I went to an appointment this week. Um, in fact, it was Dr. Pete. He was here a few weeks ago and, and did the, the cancer killer thing. I went and, had, and, and got an adjustment. It was cold in the morning. It was, I don't know, 10, 15 degrees. But I don't want to go in there with a coat on. You've got to find a place to put the coat, this, that, and the other. So it's 50 feet from the vehicle to the door. So I got out of the vehicle, took my coat off, put it inside, and walked in my shirt sleeves. 10, 15 degrees. <laughs> There's a grandma in there. Sees me coming in in my shirt sleeves. What do you think the first thing is she's going to say? Where's your coat? Now, if they know nothing about God, the next thing they'll say is, you're going to get sick. And they'll pronounce something negative over you. Or if they're a little milder, they might say, do you want to get sick? Yes, I want to get sick. <laughs> what kind of question is that? You know. <laughs> Was it flashing off my head? Sickness, sickness, I want to be sick. You know, it's like, that's a, do you know what she is saying? She is a fear of getting sick herself. That's where that's coming from. 
but people have thrown her under the bus. And she will sabotage a relationship, not even knowing she's doing it, before the relationship ever begins. You know, I'm I'm just drawn to these people who say, you're going to get sick. What's wrong with you? Don't you have any brains? You need to wear a coat. Don't you afford, can't you afford a coat? What? You, aren't you drawn to those kind of people? Rather than, she could have said, wow, you must be tough. Cold doesn't bother you, huh? See, now I could have sat down and had a conversation with that. I said, yeah, it really doesn't. I mean, I only walked 50 feet. Uh, not that big a deal. But yeah, I would much sooner have it cold than hot. I do not like 95 degrees and 95% humidity because there's only so much you can take off and you get arrested. I just, I just don't like that. I'd sooner have it cooler and I'll put some things on and I'll be comfortable. That's just me. You, you can do what you want, but that's just me. <laughs> and I could have carried on a wonderful conversation with her. But when the first thing that comes out of the person's mouth is, what's wrong with you? Evidently, you think there's something wrong with me, and I'm not going to go in to find out what it is. (laughs) I will go sit on this side of the room. You stay over there. I want nothing to do with you. And there's two forms of sabotage that just took place. She just sabotaged a relationship with me by coming out of her negative, fearful programming. And I just sabotaged a relationship with her because I've had enough stupid remarks in my life. I don't need another one. I'm going to go sit over there. Sabotage is usually the last step to self-betrayal. God didn't tap me on the shoulder and say, go talk to her. Thank you, Jesus. But what if he would have? Now I'd have a decision. Am I going to go talk to her or... Am I just, I got enough of that already. I'm done. See? That's how it works. Once we've been betrayed, if we believe it, it will start affecting our life and we will self-betray. Do you have anything you want to add? Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that your word encourages us to persevere, to stay on task, to stay focused, to believe what you say above what anybody else says, to have hope, to know there is a future for us, to know you have things in store for us. Thank you for your word, which gives us life. And Lord, I pray that that as as we wrap this series down and next week we come back and and give the, the points out of your word of how to beat betrayal, that Lord, this is something we really get sensitive and keen to. Lord, I'm asking that in Jesus' name. Make us sensitive and keen to how we have been changed by things that have been done to us and said to us and how we have self-betrayed and actually live our lives in a way that is different than we would have lived had we not been betrayed. We, We wouldn't have thought this way. We wouldn't have acted this way. We wouldn't have handled people this way. But since we were betrayed, now we've self-betrayed and we're, we're a whole different person because we didn't handle the betrayals correctly. So Lord, make us keen and sensitive to this. We are going to beat this. We will be a people who are not led by past memories, past hurts, past pains. We're not going to make decisions for our future on the basis of things that have been said and done to us in our past. We are going to walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, make decisions and choices, and see things clearly and accurately because of your Spirit and not because of past pains, past hurts, things we've believed or offenses we've even picked up. In Jesus' name. So, Lord, I'm asking, make us keen to this. And, Lord, help us ask us ask ourselves, or Holy Spirit, you ask us this question. Every time we have a decision to make, help us to realize we're either making this because we're being led to the future or we're making this off of past input. Which one is it? Holy Spirit, ask us. Are you doing this because of things that have happened in the past or are you doing this for a different reason? Lord, if we can clearly begin to identify 
how we are living, choices we are making, things we are doing, and clearly identify why we're doing it. Are we doing it because of past things and memories and pictures and things people have said, things people have done to us? That's making our future decisions? Then, Lord, we need to work on getting rid of those betrayals and get them off of us because they've already changed us. So we're looking for a work of your Holy Spirit to change and sanctify and renew and cleanse because all things are possible to them that believe. And Lord, betrayal tries to tell us things are not possible. We're not capable. It won't happen. It won't work, whatever. Your word says everything's possible. And Lord, we want to start thinking more like you and less like our past betrayals. In Jesus' name. That's my prayer. It's what I'm asking for, and I believe you're going to do it in us. In the name of Jesus, amen.